Hello, this is Cameron Friend with the Rethink Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the Rethink Podcast with the King Center. We're so delighted that you decided to spend some time with us today. Y'all, we have an incredible episode, an incredible topic, and an incredible guest. We're going to talk about women in leadership, a win-win for humanity. As you know, we've been going on this series of talking about things that are important for all of us to understand, issues and topics that we must simply grasp in order to be better and to build a true beloved community. The next generation of leadership is gearing up to lead humanity into the future. And as we move forward as a society, we are attempting to right the wrongs of the past and to set a love-centered course for a better future by empowering the women of our society. Women have long advocated for equal rights and the ability to use their skills and intellect in the same leadership capacities as men. But there have been numerous obstacles placed in their way to stymie these possibilities. Mrs. Coretta Scott King once said, women, if the soul of the nation is to be saved, I believe that you must become its soul. As the King Center's founder and architect of the King Legacy, Mrs. Coretta Scott King embodied so much of what it means to be a leader in our world. And a part of her mission was helping other women to realize their own potential as well. Nonviolence is a way of life. And in order to embody a nonviolent mindset, we must commit ourselves to doing the work of justice and gender equity. In this episode, the King Center will highlight an increasingly influential woman leader in Atlanta and some of the great work she is doing in her own way. Tamika Rich is the SVP of Fan and Associate Experience for the Atlanta Falcons. Tamika Rich has an extensive work experience in sports marketing and corporate partnerships. Tamika started her career at UNC Athletic Business Office as the finance assistant. Tamika then worked as a student video assistant at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Tamika also served as a recruiting graduate assistant for the University of Georgia. Tamika then joined the Houston Texans as a customer service representative before briefly working as a PR assistant for Super Bowl 38. Tamika later became a sponsorship assistant with the Carolina Panthers. Tamika then joined the Octagon as a BMW account coordinator. Tamika joined the Atlanta Falcons in 2005 and held various roles, including manager of corporate partnerships, senior client services, and client services coordinators. Tamika also worked as the Director of Corporate Partnerships for the team. Currently, Tamika is working with the AMB Sports and Entertainment as the Senior Vice President of Fan and Associate Experience after previously holding the positions of Vice President of Game and Event Experience and Vice President of Corporate Partnerships. Throughout her career, she's developed strong professional relationships with clients and agencies, managed staff, and oversaw the execution of various projects and events. Tamika Rich holds a certification from Stanford University Graduate School of Business in 2023. Prior to that, she attained a master's degree in sports management from the University of Georgia. Tamika also earned a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Please welcome Tamika Rich. Thank you, Cameron. Such an honor to be here with you guys. Absolutely. Well, number one, thank you so much for joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedule. We obviously realize you have a lot of different things happening, a lot of things going on, and uh, we are deeply appreciative of all the things that you are doing to make the world a better place and the amount of time that you're giving to create a great experience for the fans, for corporate partners, uh, and just even just helping people to understand a lot of the things that happen at the NFL level. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Awesome. Thank you. So, you know, as we're talking about this conversation of women in leadership, there's still, unfortunately, a lot of things that are in the way of allowing for this to happen as it should. And there are a lot of different things in life that we have to kind of treat and to get a hold of before we truly make this a true possibility for everyone. And as you remember your childhood, who were some of the women that you looked up to and how did they inspire you to want to be a great leader in your own right? Yeah, so... Um... The first people that I knew as women um, in a working environment were the women in my family. So um, both of my grandmothers, but specifically my mom's mom. My mom's mom had um, eight kids uh, over a period of 16 years. She had eight children. 
And I remember as a kid, um, her closing down, she was the the dishwasher at a local restaurant. And so not only did she had eight kids, she would work till you know, the restaurant closed, which would get her home 11, 12 o'clock at night. And just that, that work ethic that was exemplified was she was one of the hardest working people I knew. And that carried on to my mother. Uh, my mother worked in healthcare, which was, you know, when I was a kid, she worked a lot of times that she'd work uh, seven, 12 hour shifts. And then it would be a rotation of seven off. And just, I knew hard work as um, something that was not foreign to women. And so I saw that example uh, early and often. And then I would say kind of my sheroes, um, these are going to be really weird and out of left field, probably um, where I'm sitting today. But I was a big Jane Goodall fan. So um, if you remember Jane Goodall, like she lived by herself amongst the gorillas. And to me, that was like, you know, the ability to just go and, and live in the woods in this environment was, was really something that um, I found courageous. I was fascinated with like Disney and the animal planet as a kid. Um, the animal planet didn't come along until I was much older, but um, all of that was was very inspiring. And so she was an early role model just from her independence. Uh, I wanted to be an astronaut early on. And so um, Sally Ride and the entire uh, crew that was part of the, the Challenger is is something that sticks with me forever. I was one of the kids that that got that had the experience of seeing that live in first grade. Um, and so I was coming along that at a time where there were really incredible women doing really incredible things. And to see that happening, you know, I was a little kid during the 80s. You had Oprah was our, our biggest TV star. She was doing things that had never been done from a talk show standpoint. And it was a woman and, and a, a black woman, like seeing people do things that people said they couldn't was, I guess, developmental during my childhood phase. And so I grew up with a lot of belief that I, that I could do things that others thought that I couldn't. And, you know, when you're a child and you're growing up in, in these environments, you're witnessing your family do this, you're seeing these great women leaders across the world that are, you know, in their own way, uh, doing these really great things. Did you feel like you had a, like a special trait about you that made you feel like you could do these things or felt like you had the capacity for leadership? Like, was there something inside of you that was just hungry to be able to, to lead and to maybe even mold the world in your own way? Yeah. Um, say the, the trait probably is um, naivety or um, just lack of awareness of, of the hurdles that are going to be in front of you. You know, like I saw so much possibility that maybe sometimes I missed how hard the journey was going to be. Um, and so I think that uh, that was necessary. And some of the paths that I took was that eternal optimism that I can, you know, that, that belief. Um, and I had incredible support system, an incredible support system. So I didn't come from an affluent family. Um, it was a very modest upbringing, but I had an incredible amount of love surrounding me. And so the permission to fail, but the belief that, you know, when I was five, I said I was going to Hollywood. I, I haven't been to Hollywood. That's not on the, but, you know, I was going to the moon. I was going somewhere. And I think that that naive belief in that I was going to do something um, really carried forward with me throughout my, you know, and I think that there's still a side of that in me today and that, um, you know, I do believe that one person has the chance to change the world. I mean, we're sitting here on the King Center podcast and we look at what uh, Dr. Martin Luther King did, but also what Coretta did as well. Like those are individuals that had outsized impact. And so I, I have a belief that, you know, we can achieve more than even humanly possible sometimes if we if we keep our minds open to the possibilities that are put in front of us. Yeah, I love that. I think that there's this idea that obviously it's very important to be aware of you know potential pitfalls and how to work around those things. But there's also this belief, this self-belief that you need to have. And I love that even how you referenced Dr. King and Mrs. Coretta Scott King, but even for yourself, that there's just this optimism that I just have enough. 
and I'm worthy of the greatness that's inside of me. And I love that. I think that we all, uh, including myself, could embody that a little bit more. And so, Tamika, what, what I one, uh, one thing I would say on that, Cameron, yeah. though, um, I don't think that I am uh, special in a way that makes me unique, that I'm I'm more valuable than a but I believe if you're open to, in my belief, um, faith and, and what God has in store for you, if you're open, I, I like to live my life a little bit like Jim Carrey and Yes Man. You know, if you say yes and you keep saying yes, um, sometimes it can create like, oh, my gosh, how did I get all this on my plate? But there are other times where you're like, I could have never imagined this opportunity and I couldn't have opened this door if I tried. And I think that mindset, a lot of times women are much more cautious, much more calculated. And sometimes you just say yes when you don't feel equipped, say yes. And I think that it's not that I have a superpower. It's that if you say yes to enough opportunities, you don't know what it, things can happen that you could have never done on your own. I love that. And that's such a great transition uh, into the next question I have for you. And you know, you've been working in the NFL for almost two decades. You know, did you originally have inspirations for wanting to work in the NFL? And and for you, what was the process like of navigating getting into that field, but then you know, being as successful as you become uh, inside of the NFL ranks? Yeah, so I went to the University of North Carolina um, and that I was going to be a judge. Uh, I graduated, gave my speech in, in high school graduation that I was going to UNC to be a judge. And, um, you know, that spring of my freshman year, um, I lost a friend to who was murdered. And I didn't feel that I could approach that career with the same um, lack of bias that I would carry some of that into that with me. And so, um, I was a journalism major. I still wanted to be a journalism major. I still wanted to fight for justice. Justice was a really, that's why I wanted to go uh, to be a judge was to, to be on the side of helping make sure that um, those who, you know, who were in that place were given a fair, a fair shot. And um, there was some empathy and there was, there was consideration and, um, but once I got into that environment, I thought my emotions were too mixed. I was afraid that I wouldn't. So then I, I wanted to be a war correspondent. Like I was going to go cover the injustices, you know, that were happening at the time. Um, you know, there were places like the Sudan and um, others that just atrocities were happening. And I thought about, you know, being able to go and shine a spotlight on things that were happening around the world that the normal media wasn't covering. And I went into, I took a job with the football team at the University of North Carolina. They were hiring uh, video staff for the football team. So you film every practice and game. And I knew that would teach me, you know, I'd be really skilled on the camera if I took that job. And so I went into football. I love sports. Like, you know, like a lot of kids, I played three sports a year. Um, and I loved football. It was, it was something I'd even in high school, I thought about trying to play football, which now, nowadays there's more uh, women in that, that time I would have been like one of few in the state that attempted it. Um, but, you know, I started in football actually as a way to learn the camera because I wanted to be a journalist. And, um, the more time I spent on the team side of sports, I fell in love with it. And I realized that sports could create a bigger platform for me than maybe these other places that I might think is the place to advocate, advocate for justice. And so it is, you know, now some, I guess, 25 years later, like I'm, I'm being able to have these platforms that I'm not sure that I would have had um, in some of the other choices. And so I actually got into football trying to learn a skill and fell in love with it, with the team side of sports. Wow. And you've mentioned already so many key and important things and just empathy and understanding. And I think you obviously have real life experience that has helped you to translate like what even leadership and stuff means for you. But can you give us some insight? Like, so for you working uh, in the NFL, working in football, what, what is that environment like for you? And what has your experience been like working in the NFL? And then obviously, you know, being a woman that works in the NFL as well. Can you give us some insight on that? 
Yeah, so I, I started in college football and that, you know, I spent probably four to six, I don't remember exactly how many years, probably five to six years in the, on the college side. Um, and then I've been in the NFL. This is uh, started in uh, 2003, I think. So this is um, year 21 for me in the NFL. And so I've been in the NFL a long time um, and it's changed a lot. Like when I came in, you know, we were a very small business uh, here at the Atlanta Falcons. Just the size of the staff was so small. And so there weren't that many women, but there were there were a handful. There just wasn't that many associates at all. Um, and so there wasn't that many jobs that weren't tied directly to the field of play when I first started, when I first started looking. Uh, that has changed drastically. Uh, today in this in Mercedes-Benz Stadium where I'm where I'm doing the call from, you know, we probably have 500 full-time associates working in this building alone. Uh, we have our headquarters in Flowery Branch. There's probably another, and I don't know exactly, at least 150 full-time associates uh, working there, not inclusive of our players. And then we have Atlanta United over in Marietta. And again, that one probably has about 150 full-time associates, not inclusive of players working there. And so we are a sports conglomerate at this point. And um, with that scale has become has come a lot of opportunities that didn't exist when I first came in. And just really exciting to see some of these, you know, we're talking tonight about the future generation of female leaders, like seeing what's coming behind me is really, really exciting. Um, just because with the growth of the sport has come the growth of opportunity. And there's been a real focus on it for the last couple of years, specifically of just really um, looking at what those opportunities for women are. Wow. And, you know, for you, when, when you look at leadership and you look at what defines a good leader, one, what do you think a good leader is? What are some of the traits that you think stand out for someone who uh, just is able to take maybe what's inside of them and to help other people come to turn with uh, opportunity or to, to be able to believe in something. And then for you, how have you seen your leadership skills develop over the years? And what is the hardest part of the task of being a leader for you as well? Yes, they, um, I'm a big fan of Gallup strength finder. And we use that on my team to kind of um, get to understand each, each person. And one of my top strengths is individualization. And um, I think that's one of my strongest from a leadership standpoint. It, if you looked at the other four, you might think, oh, this one probably sounds stronger like a leader. Um, but for me, individualization is so important. And what it is, is understanding the value of each individual. And the longer I've been a leader, the more you understand, I hate, you never get great at it. You're always learning. And the reason you're always learning is because when a new individual comes into play, that's a whole different makeup and a le different leadership style. And so I believe that my leadership style has to be one that that can change based on the person that I'm leading because they need something different from me. And so if I have a broad stroke approach that I, I lead them all the same, then I don't believe that that we're going to be as effective as we would if I understand the drivers, and motivators of each of them individually. And I think that um, a lot of times is missing. Like we try to take a, a broad approach. I'm a big fan of Stuart Diamond. Um, he's a professor at, at Penn and he wrote a book uh, called Getting More. And it's a book on negotiation. He's one of the foremost experts in the world on, on negotiations. And one of his principles is that the moment one person enters or exits a negotiation, the entire negotiation changes. And I think that is the same for leadership. Like if I'm leading two people and I know them really well, then my leadership might be a certain way. If another person comes in, that entire dynamic could change. You could have a person that um, is toxic in a worst case scenario enter, and then you have to change that. You could have a person that needs more hands-on coaching, and then that's going to impact something. You have a person that that is just different from the other two, and, and you can't uh, lead them all the same. So to me, that indiv individualization and understanding the individuals that you are leading is really, really important. Wow. I love that. And, you know, that really speaks to even as, as the King Center, you know, when we talk about nonviolence is understanding that every situation is different. 
but how you approach it that you want to have a core of other centeredness and uh, an idea that like, I'm going to love this person through this situation well. And then when you're engaging with people, you want to do so in a humane way, but every community is different. And so how you do that always has to adjust based on how people best receive information and how they learn and what makes them feel like they're included in the process. So I absolutely love what you just said there. And, and for you, when, Tamika, when you think about your legacy as a leader, what mark do you want to leave and then when you consider the Atlanta Falcons and you consider the Atlanta United, how do you feel like these organizations are helping to create opportunities for younger women that are wanting to step into leadership roles and, and they want to be able to explore their gifts and their talents in a similar way that you have? Yeah, I would say um, my legacy as a leader, uh, if I'm an incredible leader, I should have incredible leaders behind me. Um, I don't think I could... Uh, retire at the end of my career and say I was an incredible leader and have formed no one who's out also leading incredibly. Um, if I'm not, then I'm an incredible tactical worker. And so I think production is really important. We're all hired to do a job and, and there's there's KPIs for all of us. And I think that that is important. But for me, the growth and development of the people coming behind me um, is more important because I believe if we're all functioning as a high functioning team, the other stuff will come will come easily. And uh, really excited about uh, the team that I have currently. I have three incredible directors that um, all I believe represent really well in their space. And um, yeah, I'm really proud to have a female leading as an executive director of our event days. And so um, she's the the head of presentation for our event days. And that's, there's not a lot of females in that space. And so I believe she's doing it at, at the top and competing with the best of the best. And so excited for that. Um, and then hired just recently another young um, black female to lead our fan experience team. And, you know, she has grown from intern all the way to director here and really, really excited to see her growth and that opportunity. And, um, you know, I believe that in my career, there's been people that that helped me with opportunities and then provided cover to make sure I didn't fail. And I think that's my role as a leader. We want to give those opportunities. We want to give stretch assignments. But then we have to, you know, it's a little bit like a trapeze act. Like you can do trapeze and be an incredible performer because you know you have that net below you. And so what's the worst that can happen? You get embarrassed of it, but you don't die. And I think um, my role is to be that net, right? To give them enough space to, have, to stretch their wings and soar. But at the end of the day, I make sure they, they don't fail. You know, I love so much about what you're saying. And to me, I really appreciate this conversation because I think this idea of, of transferring, you know, what's inside of you, but also transferring leadership, you see it as a responsibility. And in terms of catering to the next generation, providing a, a safe place for them, as you talk about, giving them a net to fall into in case they need it, but give them space to grow. And I feel like as somebody who is trying in my own right to develop and to become you know, a better leader and a more holistic leader and to impact more people, it's you know, how do I create that next generation behind me as I'm learning that I'm teaching and then I'm creating these really safe experiences for people in the process. And I think that's such a, a good lesson for us to learn. And it takes time and it takes, I think, for you, maturity, because, you know, you've been in the game for a while now and you've done so many amazing things. But it's just, you just feel like sometimes like as you grow and as you kind of just go through the process on your own, these are just things that you'll you'll just pick up if you're just aware of them. Um, I, I don't think it's um, I think it takes intentionality. I think it's I'll give you an example, uh, Cameron. It's kind of like handwriting. You know, experience doesn't make handwriting get better. I could look at your handwriting today and look at it in high school and it may be actually worse, right? Like experience doesn't necessarily mean better. And I think we think in life that time and exposure means we'll get better. And time and exposure with intentionality makes us better. And so I think that intentionality is the key ingredient. Um, you know, I believe there's layers to leadership. You know, I can I can lead you and feel really good about myself. And it was one to one leadership. And I'm like, man, I'm. I'm so proud of how I developed Cameron. And then like, if, if you have to lead someone behind you, to me, that's a little bit like if you're at uh, Dave and Buster's and you go put your quarter in the machine and 
you could pick up a stuffed animal, right? Like you have the skill to pick up a teddy bear, but then you have to use that metal claw to pick up the teddy bear. And to me, that's layered leadership. Like it's really easy for me to teach Cameron something, but for me to be able to teach Cameron in a way that Cameron can teach three more people below him is really where leadership gets challenging. And I think that that is the space that that when you like you, you get to the point where you're like, oh, I led my first team and like they're clicking on all cylinders. And then when you get that layered leadership, sometimes you start questioning yourself again. You're like, well, you know, I thought I was doing great. And then this happened. And so just understanding you never get to a point where you stop learning. Wow, that's powerful. And that leads us into our, our last question as well. And, you know, when you think about Mrs. Coretta Scott King and the impact that she had on this city, and obviously she is the, the architect of the King legacy and she's the founder of the King Center. What are some of the things that come to mind when you think about Mrs. Coretta Scott King? And then for you, how has the leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Mrs. Coretta Scott King impacted you as a person? Yeah, so I, I Mrs. Coretta Scott King um, is the epitome of what happens with a lot of incredible women. Um, she did so much behind the scenes for someone else to get the glory. And I think that that selflessness, um, there's not a, like, the, the, the movement would not have been the movement without her fingerprints on it but her fingerprints aren't celebrated. She fought and fought for an established holiday to celebrate her husband, which is incredibly selfless. And I think that that is what a lot of uh, women leaders bring to the table. Um, you know, the my one of my favorite books is, um, you know, The Chaos Our Community and um, just looking through the, the things that he predicted would happen and we're sitting in today. And um, it, it feels in a lot of ways we chose chaos over community. And um, sometimes when we're debating things uh, or debating housing or we're debating things, I'm like, there is a blueprint written. If you guys would just read it and be open to it, there's, there's understanding that, you know, it's a little bit of fortune telling and, um, I think there's so much brilliance in all of his writings, but for to me, for me, um, that book of what he explained was so important and could have saved us from a lot of the heartache that we're trying to undo today. Um, and so, for me, their work and what they sacrificed for is now our burden to try to to carry out and live. Um, and that's where my passion lies. Well, Tamika, this has been an, an, an incredible interview, and I truly appreciate it. And on behalf of Dr. Bernice A. King, CEO of the King Center, appreciate the time and the effort that you have put in uh, to this conversation, but even the work that you're doing, because uh, obviously the impact goes beyond, you know, just the organization and goes beyond the city of Atlanta, but the things you're doing are impacting generations to come of leaders, especially women who are trying to make their own way in the world. And I think you know, we are deeply appreciative of that. And I think your insight today has been invaluable. And I think what you've been able to offer, and there's so much more I know you could get into, but truly just want to extend our, our, our humble thanks and grace to you for, for everything that you've done. Cameron, uh, thank you for having me. I have to extend a thank you to Dr. Bernice A. King on just what she's doing for women and how she's representing as a female leader in this space and, and the pressure that is being put on her to be a voice of reason in so many difficult conversations. Um, and, you know, there's so many incredible women at the King Center that are doing incredible work during this Women's History Month, but, but year round from Vanetta to uh, just all of the staff there and just really appreciate the voice, the voice of reason that they bring intelligently to conversations. And I, I thank you to all the women of the civil, the original movement. I don't think they get celebrated enough. And so really uh, honored to be a part of this conversation and would, would love to do more to celebrate the women who've paved the way for us to be having this conversation today. Yeah. Well, y'all, that's the King Center. You know, that's what we do. This is the kind of conversation that we have. If you want to be a part of what the King Center is doing, uh, you can find us 
on our website at thekingcenter.org. You can find us on YouTube at the King Center. Find our YouTube page, the King Center Institute. If you want to get more involved in nonviolence, you want to embrace nonviolence as a way of life, and you want to help build the beloved community, build a more humane, just, peaceful, and equitable world right where you are, join us at the King Center Institute and learn how nonviolence can be used in your life to impact your community and make it even better. Y'all, this is Cameron Friend. This is the Rethink Podcast with the King Center, and we will see you on the other side. Nonviolence is the answer to the crucial political and moral questions of our time. The need for man to overcome oppression and violence without resorting to violence and oppression. Man must evolve for all human conflict, a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. changed the world when he demonstrated what could be achieved through nonviolence. Now, you can learn how to live and practice this philosophy yourself through Nonviolence 365 Online, an innovative digital experience developed by the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change. Nonviolence 365 Online features extensive video interviews with real nonviolence practitioners, including the King Center CEO, Dr. Bernice A. King, King Center certified instructors and trainers, and veterans of the civil rights movement explorations of the historic campaigns that helped Dr. King forge his philosophy, immersive, annotated reading experiences that enhance Dr. King's most influential writings on nonviolence, custom activities, including quizzes and interactive scenarios to help you practice along the way, real-world exercises to help you start applying nonviolence in your daily life. Nonviolence 365 is a love-centered way of thinking, speaking, engaging, and acting that leads to personal, cultural, and societal transformation. It isn't just a concept for philosophers or political leaders. Nonviolence 365 is a powerful, practical approach to dealing with conflict and dismantling injustice. Whether it's in your personal life, in your school or workplace, your local community, or a national movement. Dr. King, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, and many others sought to create the beloved community, a society built on global cooperation and equity. This wasn't a lofty utopian dream. It's a realistic and achievable goal because each and every one of us has the power to make it happen by committing to nonviolence as a way of life. Take the first step today with Nonviolence 365.